Foreign Policy Council, a former director of the Voice of America. Robert Riley has taught at the National Defense University and has served in the White House and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Riley is a member of the board of the Middle East Media Research Institute. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, the National Review, among many other publications. And we are delighted to have him back here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Riley. Deacon Sabatino, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I greatly appreciate your hosting me tonight, though it's impossible not to resent anyone who is that impossibly young. <laughs> and I thank Father Fisher, my pastor, for hosting us here this evening, though it's always a little intimidating to talk in front of your pastor. <laughs> and. Uh, all my children have gone to St. Ambrose. I have a couple still in St. Ambrose, and I see some St. Ambrose teachers here, which gives me that clammy feeling that I'm going to get a grade <laughs> at the end, end of the evening. This is about Islam, uh, isn't it, Deacon Sabatini? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. We get to change the subject tonight. And this is a huge subject. And we have two Sundays to discuss it. I'm going to offer you some opening reflections upon it and then try to provide some historical context for the very notions of the distinctions between the order of the soul, the spiritual order, and the order of the city, the political order, or Caesar and the church, Christ. I don't think unless we comprehend in a philosophical way the distinction between the spiritual and the political order, we're not going to be able to understand the enormous significance of what our Lord said when he told us to render unto Caesar those things that are Caesar and to God those things that are God's. Then I'll talk more specifically about the role of the church in politics today. That I'm sure is what is most on your mind because we have some very pressing issues in respect to this subject. I can also tell you some war stories from the Reagan administration where I was privileged to serve as President Reagan's liaison to the Catholic community in the United States from the White House which meant his liaison to the Catholic Bishops Conference, to individual dioceses, to Catholic lay groups, great groups like the Knights of Columbus, many knights here tonight. My admiration for this group grew so throughout the Reagan administration that as soon as I was out of it, I immediately joined the Knights of Columbus. Um, so I, I, I had some very practical experience on the ground about the relationship between politics and the church because uh, that was what I was doing. I was reminiscing and going through some old papers in preparation for tonight. And lo and behold, I came across a White House photograph of a meeting that we arranged for the president with the executive committee of the Bishops' Conference in the White House. And here is President Reagan walking outside the Oval Office. And in the front row is Cardinal Kroll from Philadelphia, a wonderful man. In the back is Cardinal O'Connor from New York, uh, Cardinal Law in the back. There's Cardinal Bernadine on the other side. Um, they had come to the White House for uh, more than a half day of briefings on subjects of interest to them from arms control, Central America and the Sandinistas, uh, school vouchers, the fight against pornography, and of course, pro-life. Any of you who would like to see that, I'd be happy to pass it around. Well, let's begin. 
The role of the church in every age is to direct its gaze there. <coughs> to quote directly from Redemptor Hominus, quote, the church's fundamental function in every age and particularly in ours is to direct man's gaze, to point the awareness and experience of the whole humanity towards the mystery of God, to help all men to be familiar with the profundity of the redemption taking place in Jesus Christ, unquote. But the church is more than a carnival barker. It's more than saying, come on into the tent and be saved. Its role is also not simply to gaze at the cross, but to get up on it and suffer with Christ in both a unbloody and a bloody way. Everyone was at mass today or in the vigil last night. What did we see taking place on the altar? The sacrifice, the priest, the altar priestess representing <laughs> the redemptive sacrifice to us in that unbloody way. I'm reminded of an incident late in the life of Pope John Paul II when he was in his private quarters in the chapel. And one of his attendants went into the chapel and then ran right out again because he found the pope with his arms around the tabernacle singing in old Polish lullabies. And like most people who are sane and you get very nervous in the presence of a saint, you get out of there as fast as you can because you know that you don't belong. But later, the man went up to the pope and said, Holy Father, I saw you uh, in the chapel. May I ask what, what you were doing? And the pope said, yes, I was comforting our Lord. And then we saw in the following years the pope's own suffering <coughs> which he joined to that of Christ in teaching us all how to die. I had the privilege some years ago of meeting uh, Cardinal Nguyen, who was the last Archbishop of Saigon. He was put into a prison camp by the North Vietnamese and kept in isolation for 20 years. And he had smuggled into him in the cell a tiny bit of wine with the excuse that he had a stomach ailment. And so this dear man was telling me, I was interviewing him, that every day at three o'clock, that being the day, at the hour at which our Lord died, he would take a crumb of bread and consecrate it and then using his hand as the chalice, he would put in a drop of wine for 20 years. He would teach his jailers Latin and French. And one of them one day went up to Cardinal Nguyen and said, right out of the New Testament, do you love me? The jailer asking the Cardinal, he said, of course I love you. So this is the church on the cross with Christ. And as you may know, as John Paul II often remarked upon, there were more martyrs in the 20th century than in the prior 20 centuries, the prior 20 centuries. More martyrs in the 20th century killed for their faith in Christ than in the preceding centuries. So there's the church on the cross, making up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in itself, as St. Paul tells us. Why is it the, the, roles, the role of the church to suffer? Because suffering in Christ is redemptive. Our suffering, we all must suffer, is not meaningless, it is not futile. Is that not one of the most magnificent gifts of the church and Christ's revelation to us? that the suffering through which we must inevitably go, go 
is so rich in meaning when it is joined with Christ's suffering that it is redemptive for you and through your prayers, redemptive for those for whom you're praying. The enormous sense of futility in the world before Christ, before this revelation, through the suffering and death that mankind inevitably had to face, uh, was lifted. Why would anyone not wish to embrace this? Why would anyone leave it? I suppose because it's, it's hard. And you'd prefer to pretend you're not going to suffer. Uh, you'd prefer an alternate world where this isn't going to happen. Well, the role of the church today is also to be hated, as in darkness hating the light. People living in darkness hate the light because it exposes their evil deeds. They need the cover of darkness to continue their behavior. Therefore, they must do everything they can to extinguish the light. But this will not happen. As we know from the Gospel of St. John, the darkness will not comprehend the light because the light is Christ. Now, suffering and testimony to the truth of Christ, to the full truth of humanity in Christ, has never been easy. But it's about to get more difficult. The church is the last bastion of truth in our society. All the other institutions have fallen. I just turned in a book two weeks ago to Ignatius Press, giving the natural law argument against same-sex marriage. I got so bored with Islam, I had to write something else. <laughs> At least the Muslims are with us on this one, let me tell you. And the saddest part of writing this book was spelling out the rationalization for homosexual misbehavior and seeing how that rationalization has marched through every institution of American life. In the private sector, in foundations, in philanthropies, in education, in businesses, in psychiatry, in psychology, in the Boy Scouts, and in the military. The thing that finally incensed me to the point that I decided I had to write this book was the celebration of Gay Pride Day in the Pentagon Auditorium, which I knew well, with a goofy video from the Catholic Secretary of Defense, Panetta, saluting our LGBT colleagues and uh, so forth for Gay Pride Day and Gay Pride Month. This, of course, is a mandatory celebration in every department of government today so that if you wish to serve in government as a Catholic at a senior level, certainly at the level of the cabinet, you will have to accede to the public celebration of Gay Pride Day. Are you ready to do that? I'll tell you a, a, just a little war story because it's, it's a, a litmus of how quickly things have grown worse. 10 years ago, President Bush, a little more, it was more than 10 years ago, President Bush appointed me as the director of the Voice of America. Now, the Voice of America is overseen by a broadcasting board of governors, four Republicans, four Democrats. This was still the Clinton era board. Mainly people who had made enormous fortunes in entertainment and media. I mean, hundreds of millions, billionaire, with professional wrestling and other interesting <laughs> subjects. They decided that they had the authority to appoint the Voice of America director, and therefore they decided to have rump hearings on whether I was qualified to serve in that capacity. They were all given brown, plain envelopes, manila envelopes, 
with an anonymous letter in about a quarter inch thick uh, pile of my writings from various sources, including one from National Review on Aristotle and the culture wars in which I pointed out that homosexual acts were inherently morally disordered. Thus, the anonymous letter. How can Riley, a homophobe, be the voice of America? You must contact the president and have him withdraw his appointment. And there I sat for two days with grown men and women discussing this issue as to whether I could possibly serve in this capacity. That was, that was more than 10 years ago. Today, the discussion wouldn't take place. Today, the possibility of serving in a senior government position with having written that article, much less this book, means that's, that's over. Do you understand, as Catholics, as faithful Catholics, you have been expunged from serving in government at that level. That's how far it's got. Now, you can also remember from a couple of years ago, Cardinal George's famous remark, can you not? When he was speaking to a group of priests, he said this. Quote, I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison, and his successor will die a martyr in the public square. Then he added, his successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has done so often in human history, unquote. Yeah, I think it will but not first without going through that. Uh, <clears throat> rationalizations for immoral behavior work in the following way. Aristotle said in the Ethics that man is incapable of choosing anything other than what he presents to himself as the good. In order to choose it, you have to think it's good. Otherwise, why would you choose it? So how do you choose something that's evil? By pretending it's good. By coming up with a rationalization that puts your misbehavior in a better light and says, well, actually, uh, this is better. This is a moral order that is superior to the one to which I'm called or otherwise acclimated. And what happens usually after a grievous sin? The recognition that it has been a grievous sin and some contrition. And the rationalization disintegrates in the face of reality. But what if you dedicate your life to a form of serious sexual or other immoral behavior? The only way you can continue to choose it as good is to make the rationalization for it permanent. In other words, you have to eliminate your conscience by constructing an alternative reality. Now, this alternative reality is only going to function effectively if you can get everyone to agree to it. If Deacon Sabatino is around, <laughs> he's going to say, no, I'm sorry, that what you're doing is inherently immoral. It is wrong. You should stop doing it. You are harming yourself, and you're harming everyone else around you. That rebuke from Deacon Sabatino cannot be allowed because it endangers the rationalization that allows the person to continue with their misbehavior. Therefore, he must be shut up. The, the whole psychological impetus within rationalization demands conformity, demands the universalization of the rationalization to make it mandatory. And it can only be mandatory if it comes with penalties. And that's where the government comes in. If you can seize the government with this rationalization, then you can use its apparatus to penalize those who are potential rebukes to the rationalization in which you're engaged. Does that help? Um, by the way, you know, 
Benedict XVI did not choose his name accidentally. He saw this coming well before Cardinal George made his remarks a couple of years ago. He was hearkening back to Saint Benedict, who played such a central role in preserving the church and the principles of our civilization through the Dark Ages, so the roadmap to the restoration, restoration of civilization was there. And Benedict XVI predicted a new Dark Age in which the church will be considerably smaller, but better, formed in small communities where families can sustain themselves in the faith, within which this blueprint for civilization will be preserved so that once this new dark age is over, what Cardinal George predicts here will take place, that this recovery will take place. Did any of you ever see Skellig Rock off the coast of Ireland in the Atlantic? You've seen it. Is that not an impressive sight? To give, give you, they're off the uh, South Atlantic coast of Ireland, out in the Atlantic, rising almost horizontally is this Skellig Rock, which the monks climbed up, burrowed into, to have a monastery that could survive the Vikings and the other barbarians who were pillaging in the Dark Ages <coughs> to keep their manuscripts, to reproduce them, living in this very Spartan way. And I, the image of Skellig Rock has always stayed with me as what the church did, and of course the Irish, to save Western <laughs> civilization. <laughs> now let's get to uh, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. <clears throat> this, of course, means that some of the things here, as well as there, are God's. Because God is now here in the incarnate Christ and in his church. Because before Christ, it would have been easy to say that everything was Caesar's. Because Caesar was a god, right? Right on that coin in this episode in the New Testament uh, was an image of Caesar referring to the divine Augustus, to his divine lineage. In fact, let's step back now to take a look at how the notions of what is properly political and what is properly spiritual arose in the first place. The notion that not everything is Caesar's would have struck most people in the ancient world as very odd indeed because they lived in cosmological empires in which there was no such distinction between the political and the spiritual. Let's take, for instance, the example of the pharaohs in which the divine order in the heavens which were not transcendent, there was nothing above the cosmos, they were within, the divine order in the heavens was replicated in the political order of the pharaoh, but there was no word for political order because the pharaoh, of course, was divine. So he is replicating in his person and in his court a divine order. And it is only through your proximity to the pharaoh that your existence takes on significance. You could draw concentric circles around the pharaoh and see in which circle you might fall and by that adjudge your importance. How close to the divine center the pharaoh himself were you. And the farther out you were, the less important you were. And lo and behold, what if you were even out of, out of his lands? I remember years ago reading in the Louvre in Paris a script from a, an Egyptian soldier who had been sent to fight somewhere in Mesopotamia. And he was terrified he would die there. Because if you died outside of the Pharaoh's realm, your, your, your soul could that then make the passage into the afterlife. 
That's how important and how literal this kind of thing was thought through. No distinction between the divine and the political, between the spiritual and the political. It's all bound up in the divine ruler and in his order, this cosmological empire. The first indication that this was a misunderstanding of the nature of reality came with the initiation of philosophy and was articulated most specifically by Socrates and Plato, who, <coughs> excuse me, who posited that there is a distinction between the order of the soul and the order of the polis or the political order and that the two are not congruent, that they are different, that your soul is ordered to different ends than what the political order is ordered to. How did Socrates demonstrate this or illustrate it? In the Republic, he asked the following question. What if the spiritual order was transposed into a political order and you tried to meet the requirements of the soul through political means? Man would be totally fulfilled through political means. If you did that, what would the state look like? What would be required of the state? And he came up with regimentation, eugenics, the destruction of the family, militarization. Just about every feature of modern totalitarianism is there in the republic. As a consequence of which, believe it or not, some modern scholars thought Socrates is a prototalitarian. He wasn't recommending this. He was dramatizing the difference between the spiritual order and the political order. <coughs> Let me give this to you in one of the most beautiful statements from ancient philosophy made by Socrates when he is discussing how you ought to live and by what standards. He, of course, came to the conclusion that there is something higher than the city. There's something higher than the political order. That there is a standard of justice that applies to all people everywhere and at all times. There's not one standard of justice for an Athenian, another standard of justice for a Spartan, a third standard of justice for a Persian. Only one standard of justice everywhere at all times for everyone. Why? because everyone's soul is ordered to the same good. There's not one good for you and a separate one for me, and Deacon Sabatino gets a third one. The very reason, the, the whole idea of human nature, that we have human nature, means exactly that, that our souls are ordered to the same good and that this good transcends the political order that the political order cannot meet the needs of those ends. And that if you use politics to try to do that, it will be tremendously destructive of both politics and of man himself. Socrates got into a lot of trouble for saying this. He was put on trial because it was considered, you look puzzled, it was considered disrespectful of the gods of the city. Basically, he's saying, well, no, 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 we don't, we don't have separate gods here for Athens and other gods for Persians. There's only this one single standard of justice, the same good everywhere. So here in one of the most moving passages in political philosophy, Socrates says, listen to this closely, in heaven, there is laid up a pattern of it, of what? the ideal city, the one that doesn't exist here and can't exist here. In heaven, there is laid up a pattern of it, methinks, which he des who desires may behold, and beholding may set his own house in order. But whether such a one exists or ever will exist, in fact, does not matter, for he will live after the manner of that city 
having nothing to do with any other, unquote. Do you get it? Once you perceive this ideal city, the city in heaven, which St. Augustine had another name for, didn't he? He called the city of God. That is the city by which you'll live, not the political city in which you are actually located. You are going to adhere to that single standard of justice which obtains in this ideal city in heaven. Socrates gave his life for saying that. He was offered any number of outs. He was offered exile. He refused all of them because he said it is better to die than participate in a lie. That the greatest evil for man is evil, not death. So he chose death over a lie. So here is a good man in a political order that makes claims against the heavenly city. Socrates refuses to abandon that heavenly city and gives his life. Now in the Republic, there is a discussion of what happens to a good man in any political order. Here's a discussion, here's a view. Glaucon makes this statement. This is 400 years before Christ. Listen to this. The just man who has such a disposition of being actually good will be whipped, he'll be racked, he'll be bound, he'll have both eyes burned out, and at the end, when he has undergone every sort of evil, he'll be crucified. Isn't that extraordinary? That's what happened to the just man, the good man, 400 years later. Now, this city, this ideal city in heaven that Socrates saw was, of course, a premonition of what St. Paul described in letter to the Hebrews, his description of Abraham as, quote, looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and maker is God, unquote. And of course, St. Paul's declaration, as you well know, as you well know, we have our true citizenship in heaven. That's our city, not here. We live by the standards of that city, not this. As I was growing up in this country, as were a number of you who are not as young as Deacon Sabatino, <laughs> we remember a different sort of place that where the conflict between the two uh, was not so great. In fact, close to imperceptible. There was no abortion. Pornography was not allowed. There was free exercise of religion, etc. Now this, as we know, has changed, and that's what we're here to discuss tonight. So Augustine, of course, expanded upon this concept uh, in his elaboration of the city of God and the city of man, which became the heart of Catholic teaching in elaborating what is Caesar's and what is God's. Now, um, what's, what's particularly valuable about this? I think what's particularly valuable is that Christianity makes politics possible because it is Christianity which limits politics to what it should be, to what its proper sphere in life is, and keeps politics from overreaching itself uh, to become something which it isn't. 
Let me quote to you from my dear friend, Father James Shaw. And if any of you want to explore this kind of subject matter more deeply, I recommend to you any one of his 35 books. <laughs> He's just retired to Los Gatos, California after teaching at Georgetown for so many years. Great, great political philosopher. He, he had a book called The Politics of Heaven and Hell, which I read many years ago, and this passage always stuck with me. Listen to this, quote, Christianity was vital to the very structure of classical political thought because it was able to give a reason why politics did not have to be concerned with man's highest destiny or virtue. Resurrection and the kingdom of God suggested both that man's deepest desires would be fulfilled and that politics could consequently pursue a temporal good in a human finite fashion, unquote. The burden of salvation is lifted from politics and placed where it belongs, with God and in Christ. Therefore, politics is relieved from trying to generate some kind of substitute salvation and meet those needs of the soul about which Socrates was talking, as well as St. Paul. So I would contend with Father Shaw that it is Christianity that makes politics possible. And where Christianity loses its influence in limiting politics to what it is, you see then the attempt by politics to take on a salvific role for which it requires, guess what? All the features of the proto-totalitarian state that Socrates laid out in the Republic. It needs absolute power. If it's going to be salvific, it needs to be like God, right? And, and what does God have that the state then needs? Absolute power, which it gets through its monopolization of that power, and omniscience. How does it get that? Through the secret police. Someone said the NSA? Okay, you can. Um, this is very, 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 very profound point. Politics cannot and should not attempt to transform man spiritually or turn the world into paradise. Instead, politics ought to arrange the material circumstances of man's life to mitigate the effects of evil so that he can pursue virtue and in so doing achieve the ultimate happiness that lies beyond politics. The church has to defend these limits so the city, the political order, does not succumb to the temptation of transforming itself into the engine of man's salvation. Otherwise, as I said, the city, the political order will approximate some version of the proto-totalitarian state. Now, there's a way that, um, there's a way that Benedict XVI said this. He said there is no intra-historical perfectibility. That's clear, right? <laughs> Pope Francis is trying to speak a little more plainly. By interest historical perfectibility, he means that the perfectibility of man cannot take place inside of history. It's going to take place in the transcendent with Christ in his kingdom. That's where the perfectibility of man is possible. It's not possible here. And if you attempt it, you will cause great evil. Christ is the Lord of history. It is Christ reconciling all things to himself that is the true meaning and source of history. Anything that else assumes a human lord of history is a lie, is a phony. If it is Marx's class theory of history through which he is going to reach the perfectibility of man, 
it's a lie. If it is a race theory of history, such as under Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, it's a lie. And the attempt to reach Aryan perfection or proletariat perfection opens the maws to the death camps, the gulags, and the massive slaughter of mankind, all in the name of his intra-historical perfectibility. I want to give you just a little taste of this. I found, as you could tell, a yellowed scrap of paper on which we can hear directly from Adolf Hitler. The, the opponent, is. I hope I've made clear by now, to these enterprises to perfect man in history and in this world, the opponent, just as it stands as the only opponent today, is the church. And it is why the church must be destroyed by those who attempt these enterprises. Let's, let's hear how Hitler expressed his opinion of the church. This is revealing. Quote, the religions are all alike, no matter what they call themselves. They have no future, certainly none for the Germans. Fascism, if it likes, may come to terms with the church, meaning Mussolini. So shall I, why not? That will not prevent me from tearing up Christianity root and branch and annihilating it in Germany. For our people, it is decisive whether they acknowledge the Jewish Christ creed with its effeminate pity ethics or a strong heroic belief in God in nature, God in our own people, in our destiny, in our blood. A German church, a German Christianity is a distortion. You cannot keep both. We don't want people who keep one eye on the life and the hereafter. We need free men who feel and know that God is in themselves. Heil Hitler, right? <laughs> if you think anything less is happening today, in this sense, that we are no longer going to acknowledge what is given to us in our nature by God, as an order in our soul oriented to this heavenly city, this kingdom of God. And we are instead going to accept as real only those things which we can change, meaning everything that we can make the object of our will, because we are going to create the world in our image. We're not in God's image. That would confine us. We're going to remake ourselves in our own image. What is that image? I don't know. Hitler's, Marx's, Pol Pot's. Whatever the will, whatever you have the power to will. The refusal to accept reality, the refusal to accept as real anything that you cannot change. That is the modern enterprise. That is not the American enterprise as it was understood at the foundations of this country. There was a tremendous hope within the Catholic Church expressed by Cardinal Gibbons and many other people that the church would flourish here because its principles were coherent with and compatible with the founding principles of the United States. And indeed, the founding principles of the United States are incoherent outside of Christianity. They're inconceivable without Christianity. In fact, they were conceived within Christianity. I want to just jump to something I was going to say later. This is from our founding father, John Adams, in correspondence with Thomas Jefferson about what they believed were the ideas, uh, the foundational ideas for American independence. So Adam asks in his letters, quote, and what were these principles? I answer, the general principles of Christianity in which all those sects were united 
and the general principles of English and American liberty in which all these young men united. Now I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God, and that those principles of liberty are as unalterable as human nature. I could therefore safely say consistently with all my then and present information that I believe they could never make discoveries in contradiction to those principles, period. Can you see the compatibility? It was present at the beginning. And the extent to which we have a problem today is exactly from the loss of our own founding principles. Now, let's get back to Caesar. Lord Acton, the famous British thinker, wrote that, quote, when Christ said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God, God's, he gave to the state a legitimacy it had never before enjoyed and set bounds to it that had never yet been acknowledged. And he not only delivered that precept, but he also forged the instrument to execute it, to limit the power of the state, ceased to be the hope of patient intellectual philosophers, like Socrates, and became the perpetual charge of the church. The role of the church in politics today, that's it. To limit the power of the state, ceased to be the hope of the patient intellectual philosophers and became the perpetual charge of a universal church. Uh, once again, upon what basis is the state to be limited? On the basis that it is not salvific, only Christ is salvific. The state is not charged with our redemption and is incapable of achieving it. And if it tries to, it will destroy itself and man as well. This, by the way, is part of the problem with Islam. For those of you who suffered through those talks a couple years ago. <laughs> you know, I, I pointed out in that respect the statement of the Islamist ideologue Sayyid Qutb, who made this revealing remark. He said, Islam chose to unite heaven and earth in a single system. In a single system, meaning we're going to build that divine kingdom right here. We do have perfectibility inside of history. We will have perfect justice here. The whole point of Socrates and his speculation that we have immortal souls was that he saw that perfect justice is impossible in this world. Well, that, well what then happens to the, the demands for justice, which is center to our very beings? He said, well, there, we must have immortal souls, a place in which this perfect justice will be achieved. But he made the point to the Republic but that it can only be achieved there and not here without creating a totalitarian state. And this is the problem with Islam. They break the distinction between the transcendent and earthly and say, we're going to construct God's perfect justice here. OK. Now, let's also remember that the state does have a legitimate role and that the church is not to confuse itself with this role. Christ was offered the crown, but took the cross. He said his kingdom was not of this world or his legions would have defended him. The Jews thought the Messiah, Messiah would be a political figure and tried to make Christ king. Christ repeatedly makes clear that he is not that kind of king. Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Were they his to give? Christ refuses them. He's asked to turn stones into bread, have a welfare state. He said, man does not live by bread alone, 
but by the word of God. He came to feed souls, not stomachs. This is not to gainsay the importance of man's material needs, but it is to make the point that it is the role of the secular political order to provide for those needs. That is what is, it is limited to. If the church were to destroy the distinction between the kingdom of heaven and this world, as Islam does, it would wreak as much harm as has been caused by the refusal of the state to acknowledge the kingdom of heaven. This was certainly seen in the heretical movements of the late Middle Ages when notions of Christianity arose to literally establish God's kingdom on earth. They caused great havoc and damage. Perfect justice cannot be achieved here by either ecclesiastical or secular means. It can only be obtained before the throne of God in his transcendent kingdom. Now, that brings us to the bishops' conference. Just kidding. <laughs> I've got some things here that we're not going to have time to go through this evening about what is the proper role of politics and also what is our proper role as Catholics in politics. There's a wonderful doctrinal note from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith called the Participation of Catholics in Political Life. But I think I'll save that uh, for next week. How's that for a tease? I'm sure you're dying to hear what's in the doctrinal note, right? Um, let me instead turn to oh, I can't I can't I can't uh, resist this. Do you remember what I just read from John Adams about these truths being immutable and as certain as the constancy of human nature and of the essence of God? I want to read you this from uh, Barack Obama in The Audacity of Hope, his book. He writes that quote, implicit in the Constitution's structure, in the very idea of ordered liberty, was a rejection of absolute truth. <laughs> was a rejection of absolute truth. The infallibility of any idea or ideology or theology or isms and any tyrannical consistency that might block future generations into a single unalterable course. A rejection of absolute truth. Our country is founded on a rejection of absolute truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher who joined the Nazi party, was going into his classroom in Heidelberg one day, and he looked over the arched entranceway, and there was repeated the line from St. John, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And he said to his students, no, no, no. That's not correct. Be free and ye shall be true. Reverse. It is not through conforming yourself to what is, to the order in your soul and its desire and its, its, its orientation that makes you free. The real freedom is freedom from sin. The real freedom is freedom in Christ. The real freedom is conforming oneself to God's will. That's freedom. Our founders knew that. That's why you have to know the truth before you're free. Otherwise, you'll be enslaved. But no, no, this is reversed. Be free and ye shall be true. Freedom is contentless. It is now the will. The primacy of the will as against the primacy of reason. The last man standing, ladies and gentlemen, is the church. 
time for some more moments? Father Fisher read from the pulpit of St. Ambrose across the street. This apostolic letter, January 30th, 2012, from Bishop Laverde and the Bishop of Richmond, Bishop D. Lorenzo, regarding the HHS contraceptive and abortifacient mandate. So what did our Prince of the Church tell us? He said, unless the rule is overturned, we Catholics will be compelled either to violate our consciences or to drop health coverage for our employees and suffer the penalties for doing so. We cannot. We will not comply with this unjust law. Thank you, Bishop Laverde. Of course, it is one thing to say that, and then there's the doing of it and all that obtains uh, with that. Um, some of that was forecast in another extremely courageous statement, which I don't seem to be able to lay my hands on at this moment, but I can say for you next week. But anyway, Deacon Sabatino is waving his cards in the back of the room. <laughs> and therefore, um, oh no, I'm gonna cheat. Because this is, this, is, this, is no, this is when you know you're in the right place. When you hear the leaders of our church speaking like this. Here's Archbishop Robert Carlson of St. Louis. Quote, I am convinced that taking up the cross is the way to life. I am convinced that before the cross there is no defense. I am convinced that Jesus won victory on the cross and that he will win victory in us if we take up our cross and follow him. Will you stand with me and say, Jesus, I will take up my cross and follow you? Will you stand with me and say, Mr. President, we cannot comply with this mandate. We will render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but we will not render unto Caesar what belongs to God. Brothers and sisters, we must be prepared to suffer for our convictions." Unquote. Thank you. Dr. Riley, it's a complete privilege to learn from you. Um, I'm Thank you for the promotion, but I am not Dr. Riley. Oh, yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Gloria Herring from Mexico. Prudent and wise people learn from history. From other countries that have suffered what is taking place now in the USA, we know we should be prepared for the we should be prepared for the ultimate sacrifice. But besides braveness and zeal, what we as a society and individuals need to face what's coming next. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, the poignant history of Mexico has much to teach us in this respect. But I'm not sure I understood. Were you asking me what's coming next, or? Oh, it's going to get worse. Oh, how do you prepare? Um, you have to steal yourself and pray, and to get ready, and prepare your families. This is gonna get rough. The, 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 you know, the nature of rationalization is such that you are not engaged in a dialogue with the forces of rationalization. They are not interested in discussing the truth. They are interested 
in continuing with their behavior. Uh, that's why all the debates and arguments are phony. The, the purpose of it is to, to shut us up. Uh, so the, the other thing is to not shut up, to insist on the truth, to bear witness to the truth. Uh, next week I'll say some rough things about what the church has failed to do in terms of catechesis and preparation for a moment such as this and how we could be in a country that is uh, about a quarter Catholic what could that possibly mean when the situation is degenerated to the extent it has? If we were really a quarter Catholic. So um, I, I think that uh, we have to prepare ourselves with realism, spiritual realism, uh, which means as rough as the situation is, it's, it's never without hope. But perhaps not hope for material improvement, but for the ultimate hope. Things get very real in that respect when uh, they get tough. And they're going to get tough. I, 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 I can't put a smiley face on this one. It's going to take prayer, discipline, self-discipline, and it's going to take preparation so that these forces can be engaged. You know, I made sure in this book I finished on the subject of same-sex marriage, uh, there was absolutely nothing in it about religion. That it is all argued from reason and from the order of nature as our reason gives us to understand the ends in things as they are. So that I cannot be removed from the public square on this argument by saying, oh, sit down, Catholic, shut up, Catholic. Don't impose your faith on us. Sorry, pal. I'm quoting from Aristotle's The Politics, from Socrates' Republic. You have an argument, address it at that level. Because your lie exists at that level. Sorry, that was more than a breath. <laughs> you were allowed more than a breath. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Uh, um, when we pray the Our Father, we pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. How does that, how do you integrate that with your teaching that, which if I understand it, you are suggesting that we cannot have justice on this earth, we cannot have heavenly things on this earth, but we pray that your kingdom should come. On Superb earth. question. Thank you for that question. That's excellent. We can't have perfect justice on this earth. That's what I meant. Not justice, perfect justice. It is the purpose of the political realm to institute justice as well as it might be through a fair rule of law and fair court system, but that's never perfect, that's all. Now, thy kingdom come uh, means in you. That's the only place this kingdom can come here is in you and in me. In us. In us. It's different than you and me. Well, us, we're together, it makes it us. Now what does that mean? In Socrates' terms, it means he's living according to the heavenly city. Not to, an earth, not to any earthly city in which he finds himself, but in the heavenly city, or as St. Augustine said, the city of God. By already living according to the lights of the city of God, you become a different human being. You become more of a human being than you could possibly be were you not living according to the lights of that heavenly kingdom and by God's grace, which perfects nature. You become a new man, a new creation in Christ. Not perfected yet, maybe not a saint yet, at least I'm not. I don't know if we could say us. That we're <laughs> but the, when, when, you, when you do this, you become different. You treat people differently. Your family is different. And there are, if there are enough of you, your, your community is different. And there are, if there are enough such communities, your political order is different. 
And guess what you had then? It was called Christendom. That was Christian civilization. So yes, it affect, by thy kingdom, when that, when that kingdom is in your heart, when it reigns in your heart, it exudes, it, it goes out from that and affects everything around it, including the political order, which changes on account of it. Where the heck did you think charities and hospitals came from? From the new man in Christ, the fabulous education system, from the new man in Christ, the great religious orders. So it's not irrelevant, it's not private. I was, I was not suggesting that by living according to the lights of this kingdom of heaven, we're doing something private in our own little corner that doesn't affect the pub public realm, not at all. And I'm so happy that you asked that question that I could clear up any uh, confusion in that matter. But we no longer are living in Christendom. I'm afraid Christendom is gone. Uh, so the role of politics today, the church in politics today is different from what it would be in Christendom. But does that, did I answer your question? Okay, thanks. I've been interested in, in um, Benedict's comments about small communities, and I'm wondering whether there's going to be a role or, or need for families to collect together in um, small communities to support each other. People are losing jobs, losing health care, um, having problems with schools because of conscience <coughs> questions. Is that a possibility, or, or what? Yes. What, could, what suggestions could we think of? I think that's exactly what uh, he had in mind. And I think that's exactly what's happening in, in uh, places like Front Royal and other Catholic communities that are forming and, and what some religious groups like Opus Dei are doing in forming these communities that live with religious discipline uh, and charity and support. I, I think that is the future and there will be more of it. A smaller but a better church. Can I add one thing, Professor, to your, to your comment? Please. That, is that our parishes are to be our spiritual homes and we have to be investing in our parishes and making them our spiritual homes. We can't simply rely upon Father to do everything. Huh? We need to be taking an invested role in forming the community of our parishes and then our parishes will begin to be spiritual homes and then be healthy again. But we have to take that initiative. Absolutely. Um, so I vacillate between feeling despondent about way, the way things are, and I can't, obviously, because I can't give up the fight, and I have two children, one of whom is an eight-month-old baby. And so um, I want to stay learned and engaged and educated, but it also depresses me when I read all these things. So I was wondering if you struggle with that and if you could, do you have any tools you use to sort of help yourself through these dark periods where you're still engaged and, and uh, what such forth? Red wine. <laughs> But thank you for that question. One of my concerns about speaking on the subject tonight and next week is that I'm just going to depress everyone. <laughs> and I seem to have achieved this objective <laughs> with you. I have four young children, uh, having come to the marriage state very late in my life. And uh, this, of course, is of tremendous concern, and therefore, my wife and I are primarily focused on the formation of our children. Uh, you know, growing up here in the 1950s, there was really only so much trouble you could get into. I stole a bottle of Coca-Cola in the parish school. The nuns caught me, it was a bad scene. <laughs> um, but I mean, how much, because the public order was still morally healthy, 
you know, there, there was only so much trouble you could get. And that, of course, is gone. That is gone, gone with the internet, gone with the flood of pornography. I was a junior at Georgetown University before someone explained to me what homosexuals do. I said, you man, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> no, that's it. It was a joke. So, but my, there are my children in grade school. I have to dis discuss this around the dinner table? Gay marriage? And what, what is this all about, Dad? That's pretty, that, there's the little index of, of how far down things have gone right there because the innocence of children is compromised by this rationalization in this film. So I would, I would say that your question invites the answer and give the formation of your children everything you possibly can. Uh, and that means, in addition, uh, you know, the, in, formation in the faith always means intellectual formation. Fides et ratio. Don't leave out the ratio, the reason. Don't, they need to be equipped to fight in the public square because we're not going to surrender it. Uh, that is a lifetime's worth of education right there. That's a big job. Thank you very much, Professor Riley. Oh, thank you so much.